Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. One of the nice things about producing your own television show is you get to spend a lot of your time going to fun places and meeting interesting people you might not otherwise visit. A couple months ago, I went to Rantoul, Illinois, to the now decommissioned Chanute Air Force Base, where thousands of antique tractors and vintage farm equipment is put on display. The venue is vast. You can't see it all in one day, even using one of the hundreds of golf carts rented to visitors. We spent the day on the airstrips visiting with some of the exhibitors and looking at their displays. Here's some of what we saw. I'm here because this is my favorite show of all shows in America. I've never missed one of these. I was at the very first one and I've been at every one since. I collect antique tractors and farm equipment and uh, I, I looked forward to this for two years, ever since the last one. And uh, Tuesday I drove 831 miles from my house in South Georgia here. It took me 15 and a half hours. I pulled this tractor behind me and the one that sat beside me, standing beside me here. And, I uh, just love everything about this show. I'm here the whole week till Monday, and then I got to go on the road and film again. But uh, wow, I'm having fun. I grew up on a small farm in southern Illinois and uh, still have a farming operation there. But I live in South Georgia now, and I have a small farm down there. I have most of my antique tractors there. Also, I have a place in Atlanta. That's where our production company is based at. And I have an agritourism business there. But um, uh, I love the Midwest. I've missed the Midwest, especially the older I get. You want to come back to your roots, but I don't think it ever will because I got five grandkids in Georgia. <laughs> you know how that goes. So, um, but this show is, I always say this to people who've never been to this show. If you only go to one antique tractor show in your life, it should be this one. It's like, it's in a, it's in a class all by itself. In volume and quality and, and diversity. And, the, and you get to see the stuff working in the fields. Most antique shows you static displays. You know, you walk around, you see everything. You see it working in the field, and that's just priceless. I mean, that brings back so many memories. You know, all these tractors, people aren't just, they're not just tractors. They have sentimental value. I mean, this was my best friend's dad tractor. He bought it new in 1971. I have my dad's tractor that I drove home from the dealership in 1978. It's about their childhood memories. It's about a loved one that passed on. That's what all these tractors are about. They're not just pieces of art. I mean, we're not just doing it because we like tractors. There's a lot more to it than that. Restored or you bought it restored or no we bought it as a project tractor. Beautiful, thank you. Are uh, there are there very many like it? 
23 in the world, five are overseas. When was it uh, made? This was 1910. We own two of them, the other one's 1911. What was it used for? Breaking the prairies. Yep. So it would pull how many bottoms do you think? I got a picture of it pulling 14 bottoms. That would have been in uh, stubble. Uh, breaking sod, they got eight bottoms. So it started up nice. Does it always start up that nice? Usually it starts better. I overprimed it a little bit. Took a couple extra pulls. A lot of times it's the first and second pull. They all got their own little attitude for starting. Directly related to how many people are standing watching. Of course, how many cameras. Right. When you're driving it, do you think about how many people drove it before you? You're busy thinking about who's going to walk in front of you. Right. You're... The pageant works like magic. We go to tractor shows, excuse me, and we see rows and rows and rows of tractors. When you go home, did you learn anything that day? Right, right. But we like to show people how this stuff worked and, and have a little information out there that they can read while they're going by, like this cub. They come out with a one point, I believe, in 55. Okay. Um, they had the two point on, like, the 560s and some of the bigger tractors, but it was, I think it was too much to design to put on a smaller tractor, so they made a one point. And uh, International, from the best of my knowledge, made 11 pieces, but yet they approved their point for other companies to use on other pieces of equipment, because the, the buzz saw and the reel mower aren't international, but it's an international point. But all these in the back row are international, all, uh, these in the front row to the blade, the two planters, and then the uh, platform carry over here by the hammer mill are all international. And with the three-point hitch, it, it's got hydraulics. You can lift it up. Yeah, and, and this does too. It does. Oh, okay. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the hydraulic, if you look at the old cub over there, it's got an empty hole there, and that's the hydraulics okay. they put on it. Right. That was an option in, I think, late 47 when they, uh, after they came out with the cub. This looks amazingly handy and useful, especially yeah, for a yeah. smaller farm, yeah, really. for a homestead. It, it really was. Yeah, it for really like, was. say, 50 acres or 100 acres, right. you could get right. a lot done with this stuff. It's all modular. It's wonderful. Um, it's a really great collection. That My cub down there, that old uh, that's a 58 with a Pruitt post hole digger, which is really a pretty rare attachment. Um, this low boy my son picked up, it's the 14th low boy made. The... Uh, Old cub over there is the 35th cub made. That's a 47 and that's a 55. Uh, this is my grandson's cub. Uh, that's my son's cub with the Wagner loader and we unload everything here off the trailer with that. Do you really? Now he's got a power unit over there, a right. U1 cub power unit. That's the 22nd one made. We didn't know if we could unload it or not. So at home, we got her lifted up right off and so then we brought it here and unloaded it off the trailer and there was people watching that ah, ain't gonna lift it yeah it, it did that's awesome i wonder it how did. much it weighs 505 pounds
this is a great display. Thank you. It really shows how it works. I, I had a lady here this morning that I didn't think she was ever going to leave. She's a, she was a teacher besides, you know, sure. retired teacher. And she said, this is, puts this it, is so puts educational. It yes. She said, this is so educational. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really wonderful. It took you a long time. Uh, well, I mean, you had at home and then here. Yeah, I, you know, whatever. <laughs> We've had it. This is probably our fifth or sixth show we've okay. had it to. So we've had okay. it at a couple other shows. Actually, Father's Day we had it out to Nebraska. So figured here, if you're going to find people that this would interest, absolutely, it, it would be here. Absolutely. You know, these are the people that that this stuff interests. And I've seen it already yesterday. That's what Karen said yesterday. She says, "I can't believe how many people. They're not even." She says, "They're not even open yet today." Right. You know, right. How many people? A lot of exhibitors, to, probably. A lot Other of exhibitors, fellow exhibitors. Yeah, that came by and wanted to talk about it. And couldn't Absolutely. believe it. Well, it's it, one thing to see the stuff just sitting out in the field, but when it's in action. Yeah, we, in the setting. Yes. You can picture how it would work. It's a great corn crib. And it's bits and pieces of several. Sure. But it all looks like it belongs together, which okay. is what we were shooting for. Absolutely. We just start with a solid blank piece of brass. We cut from a roll, 500 pound roll, to the, to the get, be able to get two coins out of each blank. Once we get the blank coin, you put it into the next press that has the die on it made. Be able to stamp this year's logo into the coin. Then the last step puts the uh, hole in it for the key ring. Then we put it in the tumbler with ground up walnut shells for about two hours and it takes the edge off the back and it puts a polish on it and then we are able to sell them for five dollars a piece. So. Are all these pieces in different shops probably? It all actually came from one flat Landis and Gear, or not Landis and Gear, uh, Duncan Meter in Lafayette, Indiana is where the is where these, now the engine didn't. It's a 1929 Satley, but the, the presses are all the same vintage from the 50s uh, from Duncan Meter. Yeah. They had a line shaft there then, running all the... They would have, they, they, yeah, they would have, they would have had an electric motor on each one. Okay, yeah, right, right. Uh, you could run them either way. This is just earlier technology. Sure. When they were doing it, you know, it was new enough when the factory shut down, because it maybe, I don't remember when, 20 years, 25 years ago or something, that factory, so it wasn't terribly long. So everything would have been electric then. Would you be shelling corn to coming out of the crib with this, or you'd be no, shelling? No, coming out of the field. Okay. So when take we, out when field? we did it as a business, right. we shelled out of the crib. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then it would go into a bin well, on the farm, or? Most, most likely it would go direct to market. Okay. Yeah. The guys that had the, the bins would have probably harvest it themselves and combine it, shell it with the combine. You know. Okay. Yeah. Over the wagon. It's usually the, the last people that had cribs was the ones that also had cattle. Okay. And then they used a lot of their ear corn and they grind it for cattle feed. So they'd grind the cob and the, and the kernel together. Yeah. And they just feed that. Yeah. yeah. They, they just took the husk off. Yeah, well, it, if, they, if there was still husk on it, it didn't just, matter. It didn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the, for, if you're trying to feed them, you'd have to limit how much shelled corn you'd feed them until you got them up to where they, the cattle, they're not smart enough to stop eating when they're full. They right, they get hot then. As long as they see it, they'll try and eat it. Now, a hog right. is smart enough. You can put a full feeder out there, and then they're smart enough, and they just eat what they need. The cow just keeps eating, and it will blow itself. So you're better off putting some roughage in there yeah. with the cob and with the husk. That's right. Yeah. And they're taking these cobs now. This is the first year they've done that and spreading them back on the land out here. They used to have somebody haul them off and they would use them for cattle feed, and, or not cattle feed, cattle bedding, right. whatever. And uh, we weren't getting very good service on them. They, they, we'd always have to wait on them or whatever. So they're spreading them whole cobs on the field? Right, right on the farm, on this farm here, yeah. Always busy. Is it? Good. Always swamped, got a lot to do. Never can get caught up, but. Hard work, but I enjoy it. I suppose you go to a real wide variety of customers. Uh, farmers. Farmers, suburban, farm, farmettes, uh, in town, you name it. Livestock. A lot of the windmills put to work, and some of them probably cosmetic, or most of them working? About a third of what we do is water pumping, a third for pond aeration. We make an aerator unit that it runs, and also about a third for novelty. Uh -huh. 
but they're all, no matter what you get from us, it's just a fully functional working windmill. It's not a toy, uh -huh. it's a real thing, even if you don't pump with it or not. And, and they're all antiques, they're all vintage, or they're, they're built as if they were vintage? Well, uh, what you're looking at right here is a, is a factory rebuild, so it's primarily new, it's an old design, but we also sell vintage stuff that's rebuilt to, uh, to look, look and work, well, not necessarily look, we want it to look old, but it works like new. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And if I had my grandpa's century farm and it had a windmill on it and I wanted to restore it using as much of the original pieces as I could, you would do that? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. We'd uh, re repair or replace as needed, but we'd try to save everything we could. We've done a lot and we've got a lot to do, but uh, we can't get everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of people just don't see the need to fix the old windmill once it's once its purpose is kind of outlived, but uh, there, there's something neat about it. It's kind of timeless, and it's just reminiscence of the old days, and I think they're worth restoring. You must work on a real wide variety of old windmills, the ones that- Sure do. That, what are they, they fold in the wind? Uh, uh, those are called veinless windmills, and yes, we've done some old veinless windmills and some old wooden wheel, wooden tail windmills. We've done a lot of work for museums through the years, uh, but primarily our business is uh, the steel bladed oh, windmills after the turn of the century. Which were quintessential on almost every farm, oh, weren't they? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. They brought the water up from the well. That's right. We like, to say, we like to say it was the windmills that won the West, not uh -huh. the Winchester. Right. So. Yeah. I mean, they were everywhere. That's right. But uh, now I'm just going to rotate the wheel by hand, and this would be the direction the wind would turn it. And as the wheel turns, these uh, pitman arms are attached to this upper yoke, and of course that travels up and down. And in the center of this yoke is the pump rod. This is what actually goes all the way down to your well and gives you that reciprocating action that's going to pump your water. It didn't seem like anybody was rebuilding old windmills. And uh, so I just started to, I bought one or two off the, uh, back, back in the day, the Penny Saver magazine or newspaper. And I started to rebuild it. And next thing I know, I had people calling me up, wanting me to help them rebuild their windmill. Now, all of that is true, but in addition to that, my great uncle Wendell Dean was an executive vice president for Air Motor Windmill Company. And I suppose he had some influence through the years. He was still living as I was just getting into the windmill business. And so uh, it was neat to talk to my uh, great uncle Wendell about, you know, the windmill business back in the day. That's great. And. Uh, but he was an executive, though. Uh, I'm more of a grunt. Right. Well, <laughs> right. you yeah. get your hands greasy. That's right. Yeah. Every day.
This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.